appeared here at the British Columbian Camp 1983, and this, of course, is Sunday evening at uh, just after 7 o'clock. Tomorrow, of course, is Monday, and the week begins to slip away very rapidly, of course, as we've learned from past experience. If tomorrow's Monday. <laughs> and that's what I said. <laughs> no, today is Sunday, the first day of the week. Now, we have been um, studying the open door to the sanctuary above, and I want now to um, just um, spend a moment or two revising a study which you had in the past, but which some folk do find a little deep to fully comprehend. For those folk who haven't heard of the course, it'll be very important too. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. Now Daniel chapter 8 deals with the rise of the ram followed by the he-goat and uh, then the little horn power which emerges after the four have replaced the one broken horn on the, on the he-goat. And the little horn waxes exceeding great toward the south, toward the east and toward the pleasant land and um, does some terrible things of course against the church of God by taking away the daily casting down the sanctuary and trampling upon the host of God. Now, in verse 13, we find this question being raised, where it says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long should be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And the answer, unto 2,300 days. Now in Seventh-day Adventism it has been a standard failure on their part to link these two things together, the question and the answer. And the 2,200 days have been more or less treated as a separate prophecy quite distinct from the actual question. But the question is how long shall be the vision concerning the daily? Now I don't say sacrifice because uh, the word sacrifice is supplied in the original text and doesn't really belong there. So how long should be the daily, or how long should be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? He said to me 2,300 days, which of course we recognise to be nothing less or more than 2,300 years altogether. Now let's, let's look now at the position of Daniel and, uh, and so we can understand why this question was asked at this particular point of time. Now, God claimed that through his people the work of God in the earth should be very, very speedily finished way back in the days of Joshua. Joshua was at the head of God's army upon this earth as the leader, of course, and during his lifetime the children of Israel finally found their way into the promised land. After 40 years of miserable wandering in the desert, they finally came to the land of Canaan. And God then, or God had given them already personal guidance in the presence of the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and established in their midst a communication centre. And the communication centre was the sanctuary. Now let's, let's recognise the fact of whether on earth or up in heaven it is through the sanctuary and the ministration in the sanctuary that we obtain our access to God. Isn't that right? Now for instance if we turn to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, we'll find this truth very, very clearly and plainly, plainly established for us in that particular chapter. And um, the verse we're looking for is verse 20. Well, let's, let's perhaps look at verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now, I've always found that folk tend to misunderstand this particular verse, verse 20. Now, it says, We have boldness to enter where? Into the holiest, that is, through the open door, right into the very presence of God, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Which way he has consecrated for us, and the way is through the veil, 
right? The way goes through the veil. Now, what is the way through the veil? His flesh. Because by virtue of the humanity of Jesus Christ, and of course by virtue of his divinity also, that we have access to God. Remember the illustration I've used so often where we, we, we put God's name and then the name of Jesus Christ and last of all the name of the believer man down upon this earth that Jesus Christ shares the life of God because he is God as God is and God with God and at the same time he shares the life of man or as Paul says in the, in the third chapter of Ephesians Christ made in himself of two one new man making peace between whom? God and man and Jesus Christ is the connector and every every um, communication between man and God must go through whom? It must go through Jesus Christ and every communication from God back to man must also go through whom? It must also go through Jesus Christ. Now, in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, for instance, we're therefore told that uh, these words, wherefore he is able to he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them so the communication between God and man is through the ministration of Jesus Christ in the sanctuary and the Old Testament of course it was through the ministration of the priesthood in the earthly sanctuary if the people had a vital question to be answered they then went to the priest or the high priest who had the Urim and the Thummim and through the indications given by these two stones they knew whether the answer was yes or whether the answer was no and of course a yes no answer if that's the only answer the other party can give of course if you ask enough questions you can learn anything can't you no yes no as the case may be now an army of course must be in communication with its leader if, if the communications break down between the army in the field and the leader back in the in the planning post what happens to the battle it goes to the other side doesn't it you may remember the famous battle of the bulge in the second world war though i guess most of you folk don't remember too much about the second world war some of you will of course some of the older ones amongst us we have that distinction remembering those things which you happened before many of you were born but um, when the american and british armies had, had reinvaded europe and driven the german army back considerably Hitler made a last desperate counter-attack to try and stave off this um, advance by the Allies. And um, it so happened that there were quite a number of Germans who had lived in America for some time and, and, and could speak the American accent. And these men dressed themselves in American uniforms, would drop behind the American lines, and the first thing they did was to cut down all the telephone wires. And in those days, of course, radio was not developed as much as it is today. And when the communications were broken down in that way between the battle, the side of the battle front and the generals back behind the lines, then who do you suppose made some good advances in, uh, at least for, the, for a short while? The Germans did, because the communications were gone and they couldn't organise their trips very, very successfully and very, very well. So then, when God gave to Joshua and to Israel, of course, the commission to carry the gospel to all the world, they were given three things in particular. One was the sanctuary. Two, and of course the presence of God in that sanctuary. Two, there were the daily services or ministrations. And three, of course, was their freedom. And those things are absolutely essential for the prosecution of God's work. Now, Satan knew that. And knowing that, what do you suppose Satan was determined to deprive God's people of as soon as he possibly could? Those three things the sanctuary, the daily, and their freedom. In other words, to destroy the communication between God and his people. Remember the, remember the other day, or yesterday, it's only yesterday, right? It seems the camp's been going for a week already, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I was going to say the other day, but it was only yesterday, I made the point that um, the Sabbath rest principles only work when there is a living connection between the member and the head. If we cut out my finger off and put it over here, then how can that thing any longer respond to the head? No, it can't. Remember that point? And the same was true, of course, with Israel. When they were deprived of the sanctuary and the daily service and their freedom, then they had lost their connection with the head and the nation could not operate as his people. Now, we know, of course, that on the death of Joshua, Israel, because they decided to follow their own plans instead of God's plans, very quickly lost 
their vital connection with God and there came the tribe they ought to have driven out grew strong and came back against them and we find that the first um, defeat of the Israelites took place sometime after the death of Joshua and the elders who outlived him it seemed that during the first and second generation there was no difficulty but in the third generation the trouble started as it usually does now when the enemies came to war against the Israelites what did they take away from Israel first and foremost they broke down the sanctuary caused a discontinuation of the daily and brought God's folk under bondage and when that condition prevailed was it possible during the period when that condition did prevail for God to finish his work or even advance his work it was quite impossible now if you look at the story of the judges of course you find there was a series of up and down experiences as the Israelites were blessed of God and then fell back into apostasy again and um, remember for instance when Gideon decided to offer a sacrifice where did he have to go? could he go to the sanctuary? no he couldn't, he had to go to a secret little grove hidden from the, from the eyes of uh, friend and foe alike and there he made his offering before God there was no daily sacrifice going on at the sanctuary and we finally come down to David's time when Israel reached the height of his glory but with the death of David and the accession to the throne of Solomon and the pride that possessed Solomon and some of you folk may remember the studies we gave on the apostasy of Solomon when we looked at the work of Jeremiah the prophet as the one who taught Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego the solemn principles of the Sabbath rest message and after the days of Solomon there began that dreadful apostasy which ended up of course in Babylonian captivity so here we find now the supreme reign of Babylon in the entire world for 70 years of duration altogether ending about, ending about 536 uh, BC now Daniel was given the vision contained in the 8th chapter just before the fall of Babylon it was the 3rd year of King Belshazzar and that's the point of time when the vision of Daniel chapter 8 was given to the prophet and in that vision Daniel saw a continuation of the past so let me draw a, a parallel down here now he saw in the ram the rise of Medo-Persia he saw in the he-goat quite correctly of course the rise of Grecia and he saw the rise of the little horn power which represented first of all pagan Rome and that was followed in turn by the arrival of papal Rome both of which powers are symbolized by the little horn power and as he saw the depredations of this little horn and let's now label this um, period up here as the period of the little horn first of all in his pagan and then in his papal form then, then uh, Daniel saw happening in the future the same sad miserable pattern as took place in the past because the, because the messenger of God said to him in Daniel the 8th chapter in regard to the little horn power and we just go right back and read the text at this moment so we have the picture very very clearly and plainly in mind Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11 or well verse 10 and 11 and it waxed great now to whom does the it refer who is the it a little horn power which was pagan in papal Rome it waxed great even to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the host and the stars to the ground and stamped upon them yea he magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him the daily was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down and the host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression and it cast down the truth to the ground that practiced and it prospered so Daniel then saw in the future a repeating of the sad pattern of the past now Daniel knew perfectly well of course that world empires don't come and go overnight the Medo Persia would have a period of time lasting who knows how long in Daniel's day it turned out to be of course um, uh, several hundred years the same with Grecia and of course Roman had the longest span of duration of all the pagan part ending about 476 AD and the papal part way down in 1798 AD and of course the papal power of Rome is not altogether broken yet either there was a resurgence or a, a reawakening a, a, an arising again of that great abomination of desolation 
Now, now Daniel knew with great clarity and and great clear well great clarity that the work of God could not advance and the purposes of God could not be fulfilled while the sanctuary was cast down, the daily was taken away, and God's pope were trampled underfoot. Now, when Daniel saw what seemed to be an interminable uh, repeating of this pattern into the, into the distant future, which was but the continuation of the past, then naturally, what was the natural question which arose at that point of time? How long? It's gone, it's gone too long already. How much longer is this thing going to go on? Now, we need to appreciate the fact that time has gone on and on and on because God's people have failed to live up to the glorious um, provisions that God has made for them. They just haven't done so. And we have developed over the centuries, which we inherit today, a defeatism. We seem to tend, we naturally, our natural thinking is that this is Satan's world. He is the one who has control of it. He is the triumphant one. And that we must expect to go through life defeated, to have failures and setbacks, for the work of God to rise and then fall again. But that is not the pattern that God has in mind. That's not the pattern. And it should, and it should not be so. Now the wonder of the ages is this, that things have gone on as long as they have. Let's look at the matter in this light. We do have in history an occasional instance when God's purposes of grace have been fulfilled through a faithful few. I think particularly of um, Daniel and his three companions. Now here was a situation where those men, despite the fact that the sanctuary was cast down and, and the daily was taken away, despite the loss of that, those four young men had established a personal living connection with the God of heaven, right? And even though they were captives in a foreign land, they were free men because Nebuchadnezzar never enslaved those four men, did he? He never enslaved them. Now those four young men found themselves pitted against the combined and very awesome might of Babylon the Great and of course the mighty power of Nebuchadnezzar the king of that country. And as you may remember from our study of Daniel several years ago, and what an inspiring book Daniel really is, we find that Daniel, there's not one record of Daniel ever knowing any such thing as failure, loss, impossibility or defeat. Is there? Not one record. Now if four young men could do that against the combined might of Babylon, when those four men understood the Sabbath rest principles and did have a, did have a, a, a connection with the head, then what could a whole nation of people do who were free, who had their communication centre intact, and with whom the daily, the daily connection with God was maintained day by day, now what could the entire nation have done? How mightily and how speedily they could have spread the gospel to all the nations of the earth until the whole earth had been filled with the glory and the power of God. They would have known no such thing as failure, loss, impossibility or defeat. I'd like to just draw your attention to a statement in the book um, Proverbs and Kings and in the first section of this uh, particular book we find a statement which tells us what God's purpose for Israel actually was page 19 in the book Proverbs and Kings. The children of Israel were to occupy all the territory which God appointed them those nations that rejected the worship and service of the true God were to be dispossessed. But it was God's purpose that by the, by the revelation of his character through Israel, men should be drawn to him. To all the world, the gospel invitation was to be given. Through the teaching of the sacrificial service, Christ was to be uplifted from the, before the nations, and all who would look unto him should live. All who, like Rahab the Canaanite and Ruth the Moabitess, turn from idolatry to the worship of the true God would unite themselves with his chosen people. As the numbers of Israel increased, they were to enlarge their borders until their kingdom should embrace the world. In other it would have been a Jewish world, not uh, as Hitler planted the German world or as uh, the Russians planted the Russian world or the Americans planted the American world. It would have been a Jewish world, but strictly it would have been a Christian world because every person who joined the ranks of God's folk would then have been true spiritual children of Abraham. Now when you think now of what God's folk had on their side compared to what Satan had on his side, when you compare the power of God against the power of Satan, 
then is it not a marvel and a wonder that Israel failed? Isn't it? That's incredible. It should never have happened. And when you think of that, of course, it should never have happened in the, in the days of the Apostolic Church or the Reformation Churches or the Adventist Church. And the question before us is this, are we going to succeed where all the others fail? Because we, we, we have the power of God. Numbers are not important because numbers, power and money, power are not the concern of God's people, but they are the concern, of course, of Babylon the Great. Now, when the angel, uh, or rather, yes, when, when the vision came to Daniel and he was told that um, under 2,300 years, eventually the saints will be cleansed. So we start back here in 4... 5.7 BC and the 2,300 days of course extend beyond 1798 to the year 1844 now in 1844 we'll fulfill the words of Revelation chapter 3 where it says that he that is holy opened a door which no man could shut a door which no man could shut I want you now to see the very close connection between those words a door which no man could shut nor would shut in connection with the state under 2,300 days then shall come the end of that time when it shall be given to give the sanctuary and the host we trod underfoot alright then let's look again at the question before we go to Revelation chapter 3 what is the question in verse 13 how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation how long to give both the sanctuary and the host we trod underfoot in other words how long before this pattern is broken forever now we know of course that it was broken but never forever in the past it would be broken for a short period of time then once again the enemies of God's folk would come and re-establish the, the uh, breakdown of the communication centre and then it would be restored but with each restoration was followed by what? a desecration, a breaking down again so when it says how long to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden to free it doesn't mean how long till a temporary restoration? It can't because there are so many temporary restorations in the past. So it must, be, it must be to what kind of restoration? A permanent restoration. A point of time beyond which never again could the sanctuary be taken, cast down, never again could the daily be taken away, and never again could the host of God be trampled underfoot. That means that from 1844 on we are literally living in the time of the end. Now true, there has been another apostasy. The Seventh-day Adventist people led by God in the Great Awakening of the 1844 period for a short time rose toward heaven but then they fell away into Laodiceanism. But, whereas in the past such an event would mean the casting down of the sanctuary, taking away the daily and, and the deprivation of, God's, of the freedom of God's people, this time it didn't happen that way because today is that door still open is that door still open right do we know it is there a people upon this earth who understand love in, in a spiritual power that great message right there is and as surely as there is then we know that um, the door is not closed nor can it be closed now let's go across to Revelation chapter 3 now to, um, to compare to compare the message of, of Daniel 8.14 with that of uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 7 and 8 8 in particular and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia writes these things saith he that is holy he that is true he that hath the key of David he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth I know thy works behold I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it that has a little strength and has, and has kept my word and has not denied my name so before the Philadelphians the door has been opened into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and that means today we can enter in through the open door with boldness to receive from God through Jesus Christ all the provision necessary for us to do the work that God's called upon us to do now this means that if every member of this movement was to apostatize and that's possible well I doubt it very much glad to say and any one of you is the only faithful person left then what about that door it will still be open it would still be open and you by faith alone as Daniel did in his day together with his three friends but later by himself 
because they seem to disappear from the scene after the great image drawing that you could enter in and, and, and draw from God through Jesus Christ through the open door the fullness of the power necessary to enable you alone to finish the work of God in these last days if it should come to that because it will seem to come to that because um, in the last great conflict there will be little companies it says in one place but in another, in another place it says many of us will be absolutely alone some in, in subterranean or other prison cells some hidden in caves and rocks in the mountains and as far as you can tell you or maybe just one or two with you will be the only faithful believers left upon the face of the earth and that will be a tough experience to say the least of it but even so we'll be able to maintain a living connection with God because we'll still have access to his presence even though there's no mediator any longer yet uh, we still will have access to God's presence during that period and we will be successful in st staving off the awesome pressure that will then be exerted by the powers of darkness now when it says that no man can shut it let's ask ourselves the question as far as God's folk upon this earth was concerned during all the past did men shut the door of the sanctuary against other men they certainly did most certainly and it is still true of course that for the apostates now you take for instance the Seventh day of the folk who rejected the 1888 message have the leaders of the church closed the doors of the sanctuary against the average Adventist person right? that door has been shut to the average person but to God's true people those who are developing the Philadelphian experience no man can shut that door against you unless you let them and of course you can do it yourself by, um, by a life of sin by a life of apostasy I'd like to turn to a statement in the Bible commentary in this connection Revelation, I mean, Bible Comedy, Volume 7, and um, we find the statement somewhere about, um, I had just the other day quite plainly and clearly, but Sister Wright makes it very clear that um, no man can shut that door, that uh, we alone are the ones who can shut that door against ourselves, and we will do so, of course, if we turn our backs upon the truth of God for this time, and drift ourselves into apostasy. Hmm. I'm just going to pick it up as quickly as I should be able to pick it up. Sorry about that, but I know the statement is quite clear here. There's a verse again, seven and eight. Um, uh, right here it is. Right. Uh, page, six, page 960 and page 961 the true witness declares behold I have set before thee an open door let us thank God with heart and soul and voice and let us learn to approach unto him as through an open door believing that we may come freely with our petitions and that he will hear an answer it is by living faith in his power to help that we shall receive strength to fight the battles of the Lord with the confident assurance of victory the true witness has given us the assurance that he has set before us an open door which no man can shut. Those who are seeking to be faithful to God may be denied many of the privileges of the world. Their way may be hedged up and their work hindered by the enemies of truth but there is no power that can close the door of communication between God and their souls. The Christian himself may close this door by indulgence in sin or by rejection of heaven's light. He may turn away his ears from hearing the message of truth and in this way sever the connection between God and his soul neither man nor Satan can close the door which Christ has opened for us now there's a warning and encouragement you can shut it yourself if you indulge in sin but if you maintain a life of obedience and trust which of course is a holy life then no man be it, no man nor devil neither man nor Christ, Satan can close that door which Christ has opened for us and the fact that that door is open and there will always be folk now to the end of time who stand before the open door and to whom it shall never again be shut that is the assurance that the work is going to be finished in these last days and we will enter into the experience of Jacob's trouble in consequence now we want to stay, study a little bit about Jacob's trouble in connection with the open door and the ministry of Jesus Christ for two reasons first of all in those parts of the, of the Bible we read about the or in the spirit of prophecy we read about the true science of prayer 
one the experience of the nobleman where his sister wife says like Jacob he prevailed and the other one was uh, in the statement from volume 4 page 1 no, volume 5 page 1089 where sister wife says that like Jacob we shall take the kingdom of heaven we shall take the kingdom of heaven by storm as did Jacob and there's another, another statement too in this connection which I shall read at this point which comes from the time when Jacob uh, was resting with the angel and um, in describing that struggle sister wife again likens this to uh, the uh, experience of Jacob and that Jacob took the kingdom of heaven by storm so you can find the statement quickly here just to remember now what chapter uh, Jacob's, trouble, Jacob's story was in but sister wife in the statement definitely talks in terms of um, the struggle that Jacob went through was an example of taking the kingdom of heaven by storm again I thought I had this right at my fingertips but I just seem to have lost track of it for, for the moment uh, yes here it is on page 1095 and 1096 in the first volume of the Bible commentary Jacob was in fear and distress while he sought in his own strength to obtain the victory he mistook the d divine visitor for an enemy and contended with him while he, while he had any strength left so he mistook the divine visitor for an enemy and contended with him while he had any strength left now that means and this is a point that um, we'll come to it'll be the focal point in Jacob's experience that we want to look at very very closely page 1095 to 6 in the first volume of the Bible commentary now when I was in Germany at the camp meeting there we had spent some time studying Jacob and Jacob's trouble and one of the believers at the end of the study asked me a question which I had never thought about before and he said this person said to me Jacob fought against God and didn't know it during Jacob's trouble and therefore that has to be a type of the fact that we too will fight against God during Jacob's trouble and not know it and that, that is the truth and uh, it sounds a very strange truth but it is the truth nonetheless and I found that in the Californian camp meeting and uh, also in the German camp too that when we came to understand how we will actually fight against God without knowing it during the period of Jacob's trouble it brought home to us a a, a tremendous realization and, and, and greatly emphasized our awareness of the need of preparation at the present point of time and we saw as we'd never seen before that those believers who today make it their special work to enter into the Sabbath rest experience who make it their very special work to establish a close communion with God those who affect the image most perfectly at the present time are the ones who have the least agony during Jacob's trouble whereas those who do not work hard at this experience today are going to go through a fearful time of stress and trial which will prove in some case, cases to be too much now I'm not saying by saying that I'm not saying that, that uh, people will fail during Jacob's trouble but remember the trouble starts before Jacob's trouble and those who have not made very very uh, deep and thorough work of preparation today are not going to be able to stand during the time which leads up to Jacob's trouble let me read that statement to you from uh, the book uh, Great Controversy the chapter is entitled The Time of Trouble and um, we're warned that when that time comes those who have not made very deep and thorough work of their of their preparation are going to find themselves um, in very very deep trouble and distress at that point of time page 622 of the page in Great Controversy those who exercise but little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power of satanic delusions and the decree to compel the conscience and even if they endure the test right, did you get the message of that? that 622 great controversy those who exercise but little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power of satanic delusions and, when the, and the decree to compel the conscience and even if they endure the test They'll be, plunged, they'll be plunged into deeper distress and anguish in the time of trouble because they've never made it a habit to trust in God the lessons of faith which they have neglected, to, neglected they'll be forced to learn under a terrible pressure of discouragement 
Now I know we're quite familiar with the story of Jacob and his uh, conflict with Esau. That's a well-known story to us, but um, we should be searching out in that story during the next couple of days or perhaps just through tomorrow some points which are quite new I think to us all and which are very very vital to our present and eternal welfare we need to understand them and when we understand them thoroughly it, it will most certainly uh, lay upon us a greater incentive a greater s- to, to prepare a greater sense of need and a greater reaching out to lay hold upon the provisions which God has made to enable us to stand in that tremendous time now for the moment I'm not going to answer the question as to what the nature of that struggle against God actually is I want simply to state that there will be such a struggle that we will fight against God until the day breaks and then when when the day broke and Jacob recognized who his assailant was he stopped fighting against God instantly and clung to God saying I will not let you go except you bless me and like manner down toward the end of Jacob's trouble as the dawn of Christ's second coming begins to lighten the sky God's folk will realize who they have been fighting against. They'll realize the nature of the resistance of God's will during that period of time. And then the Sabbath rest principles and submission to God and holiness will appear in such glory and beauty that as Jacob clung to the angel crying, I will not let you go except you bless me, so we too will likewise cling to the angel, in, cling to God in the same way and refuse to let go unless God blesses us. Blesses us. And this is a very, very vital and, and very, very powerful uh, study area for us to follow through. Now, we need to spend a little time in the lead up to this experience in, that Jacob had in the past, so we'll understand the lead up to the same experience in the end of time. So let's go back to the book of Genesis and start the story tonight. We'll be covering some ground which I think we should know, but um, I do feel it's very important to review the life story of Jacob and Esau and tie it in with the um, end time events so we recognize what is coming upon the earth what we're going to suffer and and, uh, and pass through in the time of the end so we go back now to the story in the book of Genesis which is found I think uh, somewhere in chapter 27 now we go back a little earlier than that to the um, I thought we had the story in uh, yes in Genesis chapter 25 Genesis 25 and we begin with verse 19 which talks about the birth of these two amazing young men verse 19 Genesis chapter 25 and these are the generations of Isaac Abraham's son Abraham begat Isaac and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Padnaram, the sister of the Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Now, I really appreciate the fact that she recognized her problem solver and took the problem to God. <coughs> And God said to her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And now Esau must have been incredibly hairy because... um, when in order to simulate the hairiness of, J- of Esau his mother put a, a, a goat skin was it a goat skin the kid of the goats right now you imagine a goat's hair an inch and a half or so in length whatever it was and when when uh, um, Isaac uh, rubbed his hands over Jacob's arms and felt this goat's hair he thought Esau was there so he must be an incredibly hairy person <laughs> must not he I've never seen a person that hairy <laughs> Well, he was hairy at birth, and he was hairy when he was still hairy when the time came for him to receive the birthright blessing from his father. Right, and um, we read now verse 26, and after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on, ja- on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was three score years old when, he, when she bare him. Now, the, the name or the meaning of the word Jacob is supplanter, or usurper, or one that takes by the heel. 
Supplanter, of course, uh, is a word that we apply today to people who uh, step in to take a place that doesn't belong to them from another person. Who was the original supplanter? Satan was right. He was the original usurper or the original supplanter. Now I'll read further to verse 27. And the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of, of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now I'm sure we all agree that uh, the attitude of Isaac toward Esau is a very strange one. A very strange one indeed because his determination to give Esau the birthright because he was the eldest child and rather doubtfully the eldest child because they are both twins they were twins born in the same birth and um, while Jacob was the second to be born he was the eldest only by well they were both conceived at the same time so neither was really the elder but um, despite the fact that Esau disqualified himself for the birthright by marrying uh, two daughters from of Heth from a pagan background, a Canaanite background, and despite the fact that Esau showed no interest in the spiritual responsibility to the birthright, whereas on the other hand, there was a specific prophecy saying that, that, I, that Jacob should have the birthright, and furthermore that Jacob had the spiritual qualifications for this blessing, despite the fact that uh, Rebecca and Jacob were quite consistent and uh, persistent in their determination that Jacob should have the birthright yet despite all that we find that Isaac was still determined that Esau should get that blessing now of course as far as Esau was concerned all he cared about was the financial or material side of the blessing he wanted his father's tents, he wanted his father's cattle and sheep and uh, goats and whatever else he had whatever gold or silver he might have had that's all he cared about, he wasn't a bit, not the least bit interested in the actual spiritual side of that great and wonderful blessing so the story develops as, as we shall learn tomorrow of course when we go into it more deeply we just have time to um, start off in the book Patriarchs and Prophets by reading a few paragraphs in regard to the family find the book here, what do I do with it? Hmm, I have the memory of the night, Patriarchs and Prophets. Oh, here it is. Buried over here. <clears throat> right, let's now look at the story of these two men. And uh, the story of Jacob and Esau occupies quite a large part of the book Patriarchs and Prophets. It starts in chapter 16 and goes across something like um, the return to Canaan, I think, is the, um, the last part of the story of those two boys. And that takes us to chapter 19, so there's something like three to four chapters involved in describing the lives of those two young men and the confrontation between them. Well, my time is gone now, so I won't have time to read anything from uh, the book Patriarchs and Prophets. So we'll leave it right there and pick up the story when we come back to our next study period tomorrow morning. Right. Mm. Okay. I'll tell you in the morning. <laughs> I've shut the book down, I don't have the page before me.